liar. Everywhere. On NetRootsRadio.com. David Waltman. Kagra. In the morning. Now, here's David Waltman. Hey, good morning, everybody. How you doing? It is Friday, February 2nd, Groundhog Day. It's a big radio gag day, I guess, if any. I, I don't even know uh, whether the movie has entered classicdom such that uh, the majority of listeners don't even actually know about Groundhog Day or have never seen it, or it's that annoying movie, the old movie that's on TV every year that everybody supposedly thinks is funny, but it isn't, and it's quite entertaining, and I like it. And I have seen it a hundred thousand times, and uh, I don't know. So uh, I thought we'd make reference to it today. And, uh, of course, making the joke about playing yesterday's tape, which would have been fun. But there's too much to talk about, as usual. And uh, Friday's the day I get to do it uninterrupted. Although, if you want to interrupt me anytime, or uh, whether uh, live or, or with a recorded segment, you're certainly welcome to do so. Uh, I always welcome... The breaks and uh, welcome all sorts of things. As a matter of fact, uh, I welcome I welcome gifts as well. Why not? I, I need to acknowledge Judy Vincent, our good friend in Hawaii, has sent me a batch of Hawaiian cookies, which were well received by the production staff here today. Thank you very much. I I sent her a little note about that, and uh, it it goes very well with did I did I make mention on the air or not? Scott sent me. Uh, as he frequently does around the holiday time, sent me a a batch of uh, of teas, and like uh, one year it was, hey, you're you're always coughing and clearing your throat, maybe some throat clearing, a throat lozenging, is that is that a word? Lozenging? Can you verb that? Uh, teas might be the selection this year. The very interesting selection. I like this one a lot too. Patriot. Patriotic tea, I guess. Is, I mean, that's the way they style it, which of course means I have to join a militia and hate people of color. But the tea is very good, so it's worth it. No, it's a patriotic tea. This is a collection of teas that were, I guess, through their research, allegedly uh, as close as possible anyway to the blend and types of teas that were thrown overboard during the Boston Tea Party, which it's a funny thing to market your tea that way. Well, it's patriotic tea, sort of. Well, okay, but the patriotic thing to do then, I guess, is to throw it into the ocean rather than drink it. And you wouldn't want to do that because the tea is actually pretty good. There's some really interesting ones in there. Um, For for one thing, it turns out that uh, according to their research, uh, this one green tea was one of the favorites of founding fathers like George Washington and Thomas Jefferson, which uh, I guess means, I guess, I I don't know, it makes you want to have slaves, I suppose. Um, But again, I can resist these impulses. The Patriots were a weird bunch of people, I have to tell you. Anyway, some very interesting teas and a tea infuser. I think I told you that he gave me this like baby Nessie (laughs) tea infuser, a little silicon, you know, Loch Ness monster, essentially, with an enormous long neck that sticks up out of your cup, so that you can use it to to use this loose tea to infuse your the water. So there's like six tins of different teas and a little card telling you which ones they are and how they researched what the blends were like and which one represented the bulk of the tea on board and what about the others and it's very interesting. And this one particular smoked tea, I guess, is. It's uh, quite pungent, and I like it, and uh, the, the the production staff does not like to smell it being brewed, but I enjoy it. And now I have these fantastic cookies to go with it, so everyone's welcome to send fun gifts uh, or, of course, contributions to keep the show on the air and uh, to uh, allow us to use uh, to buy uh, plates and cups to eat all the treats that the rest of you send. Anyway, it's a good day. We're happy about uh, having these things and happy to tell you about all the fantastic news stories we have. We have probably a full show we could do all Taylor Swift, but I'm not certain it's all entirely different. It's just different takes on the Taylor Swift story. But first, I feel like I have to fill you in on something about terrible Trump guy and what he's up to. There are Several bits and pieces of news. Let's just, uh, I don't know. We're just going to dive right in. 
and run through them. I guess first up on the list and first, uh, or as a result perhaps, of having been mentioned on our way to the air by uh, Justice, by way of his telling us that everything is working just fine, we have uh, this story about, well, I don't know. We'll, I don't know how to introduce this thing. We'll just have to dive kind of right into it. Where do I have to go here for this? ABC News uh, had this headline, Special Counsel, that's Jack Smith, Special Counsel, questioned witnesses about two rooms that the FBI did not search for some strange reason, some of which are explained in here, when they were searching Trump's Pervalago sex dungeon residence social club. That according according to sources, I really do hate that construction of the the headline. Here's the thing that happened, colon, sources. As opposed to, I, I guess that's a fewer characters and sources say special counsel questioned witnesses. But why even say, of course sources said it. That's why you're saying it. Anyway, the FBI apparently missed these two rooms in their search for classified documents, said sources, which I know because you used colon sources up there. Okay. Catherine Falders, Mike Levine, and Alexander Mallon wrote the story, not necessarily responsible for the headline. But uh, special counsel Jack Smith's team has questioned several witnesses about a closet. And who would store anything in a closet, right? Why not? Just just walk right past the closet. A closet and a so-called hidden room. That certainly deserves dramatic music. If I've ever heard, never did. Okay, well, a hidden room inside former President Donald Trump's residence at Pervalago that the FBI didn't check while searching the estate in August of 2022. Sources familiar with the matter told ABC News. It does not say it in here. And I have zero evidence to establish this. But I'm going to tell you because... It's a radio show, and no one checks these things. And uh, I'm all hopped up on c- sugar cookies. Eh, I didn't have any this morning, but but I can blame it on them. And tell you the secret room, and maybe the closet, I don't know. The secret room, I believe, is that fabled, video-enabled, hidden camera-enabled bikini changing room from the old, Trump's old swinging days at Pervalago when his favorite trick was to invite uh, models and others over to the pool deck there and then invite them to take a swim or uh, very frequently he would be be being interviewed by an entertainment style reporter who he would find attractive and he would say why don't you you know you know oh we have a beautiful club here thank you very much for noticing it's a beautiful club I have to admit uh, if I do say so myself why not enjoy our amenities? Why don't you stay for lunch? How about, you know, take a swim? We've got a beautiful pool right here at Mar-a-Lago. Uh, we've got the beach, of course. Oh, thank you, Mr. Trump. I would, but ha, I don't have a swimsuit, which is their way. You know, no way, pervo. I don't want to have anything to do with it. Well, don't worry about it. We've got plenty of uh, bathing suits to choose from. Some very stylish, uh, some stylish bikini uh, swimwear that... Uh, Many models, many models have uh, enjoyed in the past. We got a private uh, changing room right off of the pool deck in my private residence. You can go ahead. Just, uh, you know, no obligation or anything. Just uh, take a swim, enjoy the facilities, and then I'll see you for lunch on the patio. That, you know, I think he was trying to be smooth. And did they have such a bikini changing room? They did. Was it wired for video? Of course it was. Do I have the proof of that? Are people reporting that? Are people talking about that? No. <laughs> That's me making it up. You're, oh, my gosh. Defamation. Except it's good kind of defamation. I really like it. And, of course, all of his legal money is tied up anyway. And uh, I don't know. You always find someone to sue some people. So we'll just say, hey, that's probably not true. But uh, I don't know. It probably is a hidden room. Who has one of those? As described to ABC News. The line of questioning in several interviews ahead of Trump's indictment last year on classified document charges suggests that long after the FBI seized dozens of boxes and more than 100 documents marked classified from Trump's Pervalago estate, Smith's team was trying to determine if there might still be more classified documents there. I I think they were probably right about that. I think they think they were right about that, but I guess they couldn't come up with proof that there were more there. 
Um, it's interesting though. This story, I mean, this is current publication. I don't know why it is that we're learning the story now. If before he was indicted, they had these doubts already. So maybe that will be explained further on in the story, but I don't think I saw any explanation for that as I was skimming last night. Now, according to sources, again, it's all according to sources, some investigators involved in the case came to later believe that the closet, this is the most incriminating of the of the things here. I mean, the most suggestive anyway of, of, uh, of guilt. According to the sources, some investigators believed that, or came to believe later that this closet... Not the secret room, but the closet, which was locked on the day of the search, should have been opened and checked. Which, honestly, I mean, what? I, no one has come up with an explanation for this, really, other than, duh, let's go home. I mean, the FBI is searching your house. Oh, no, this closet is locked. What are we going to do? <laughs> We're just the FBI searching a house for classified documents. Uh I guess we'll have to leave. I mean, why not lock the whole house? Sorry, you can't come in. The door's locked and uh, we don't have a key. You'll have to come back later. What? Who gets away with this? I guess, well, former presidents, I suppose. Anyway, as investigators would later learn, Trump allegedly, this is, this is the damning business here. Trump allegedly had the closet's lock changed, right? So, okay. The closet's locked. We don't have the key. Oh, my gosh. Well, first of all, he had the, the lock changed. He has the key. And even if he doesn't have it, you know, why don't you get the locksmith who installed the lock to open the lock or something like that? Well, it gets worse. Trump allegedly had the closet's lock changed while his attorney was in the basement at Pervalago, and not in the sex dungeon, but in the document storage area, searching for classified documents in a storage room that he was told would have all such documents. So, I mean, what happens here is the lawyer shows up, Mr. Trump, I'm afraid I'm going to have to go through all your documents to try and figure out which ones are classified, and I'm going to bundle them up and we'll return them to the government because you have no right whatsoever to be in possession of these things. That's not fair. I was the president of the United States. I have immunity. I, these are all my documents, whatever. You know, the back and forth here. And then ultimately Trump gives in. So I'll tell you what, why don't you go downstairs, go downstairs to where the storage room is in the basement, go through all the papers, go through any of the papers you want. Um, you pick out the ones that are classified and get them ready to be returned to the government. And in the meantime, he knows <laughs> I've maybe I've got more classified documents. The really hot ones are in this closet. In my private residence, <laughs> you go downstairs, and while he goes downstairs, quick, bring the locksmith in the back door. While, and while the while the lawyer has been sent to the basement to search for classified documents, he sneaks a locksmith in the back door and says, "Change the lock <laughs> on this closet," so that when my lawyer comes up and says, "I mean, I don't know." that the lawyer was ever going to come upstairs and say, well, I searched the storage room in the basement that you told me about. Now I want to search your, the, your bedroom, you know, the closets in your private residence. I don't know that that was really going to happen, but if it does happen and the lawyer gets to the closet and says, Hey, open this closet. What's Trump going to say? I don't, I don't know where the key is. You know, I don't understand why my key isn't working. And maybe that was what he was going to do. I, because he had the lock change, he was just going to use the old key and say, I don't know what happened. I don't know what happened. I mean, like the lawyer isn't going to insist on getting in there. But but the lawyer isn't going to search the private residence anyway. So I'm not really sure why the paranoia. But um, it must mean there's something good or was in that closet at some point. I, I'm sure it's all long gone now. It's uh, in Ivana's casket at this point. Anyway, what a weird story, right? So Trump has the lock changed while his attorney is searching in another room. And uh, Trump's alleged efforts to conceal classified documents, of course, from both the FBI and his own attorney, are a key part of Smith's indictment against Trump in Florida. Jordan Strauss, a former federal prosecutor and former national security official in the Justice Department, called the FBI's alleged failure to search the closet a bit astonishing. I think so. Don't you? I mean, where's the key? You know, open this closet. It's locked. Where's the key? I don't know. I lost the key. 
uh, all right, well, here's 50 bucks. I'm breaking the lock. Crack. What's in the closet? I mean, maybe there's no documents, but honestly, you got to know what's in that closet. They just don't do it. Now, I guess I could see it sort of, kind of, under certain circumstances, but this is what's going on here. You're searching a former president's house. You should get it right the first time, Strauss told ABC News. In addition to the closet, though, the FBI also didn't search what authorities have called a, quote, hidden room connected to Trump's bedroom, sources said. That's the bikini changing room, probably. And, uh, but, but now that it's, I, I mean, I don't know what to tell you. Are you hiding anything? No. What about in this hidden room? Mm, what hidden room? I don't know what, the, is it, okay. I mean, maybe they don't know about it because it's hidden, but they know about it. I guess they're talking about it right here. Smith's investigators were later told that in the days right after the search, some of Trump's employees heard that the FBI had missed at least one room at Pervalago. I love calling it that. The sources said, which means it's chatter among the staff. Can you believe those suckers from the FBI? First of all, we locked the closet and then we were like, we don't have a key. So they didn't even look. Ha ha ha. And then, of course, they never found the hidden room. Well, according to senior FBI official. Uh, a senior FBI official agents focused on areas that they believe might have government documents. And, you know, that makes sense. Based on information gathered through the course of the investigation, areas were identified and searched pursuant to the search warrant, the official told ABC News. And I'm sure in filing for the warrant, applying for the warrant, they probably, probably had to try to assure the judge, well, you know, this is a former president's private residence. We have specific documents we're looking for, and we have a pretty good idea of where they are, you know, and if they had come to him with, we're going to turn the place upside down and look in his underwear drawer and in his wife's underwear drawer, that might have been a no. So maybe they were limiting themselves anyway, even before uh, not finding this hidden room and declining to go into the closet. Uh, anyway. So, within a few months of the FBI's search, the story continues, federal prosecutors in the Justice Department pushed Trump's legal team to ensure that no classified documents remained at any of Trump's pro properties, but it's unclear if those prosecutors or any Trump lawyers even knew about the unexamined spaces then. So whether or not they did or didn't, uh, you know, the way around any of it, or, or the way to wrap up the investigation is to say, well, this is what we found, this is where we searched, we know we didn't search the place top to bottom. We didn't tear apart the furniture or search the eaves in the attic or dig up any coffins and look in there or anything like that. But we need you to certify, sign this that says that you don't have any more classified documents. And if it turns out you do have more classified documents, whether we find them or just hear you talking about them or whatever, we'll just hit you with perjury charges for that. That's the best you can do, I think, at a certain point. So let's see. It's uh, in their questioning of witnesses. Smith's team seemed to focus more on the missed spaces in the three months before first indicting Trump in the case, sources said. So right towards the indictment date, they began to have a pretty clear picture of uh, what rooms existed that they had missed. Reached by ABC News, a spokesperson for the Trump campaign criticized President Joe Biden, of course, and the news media because that's their job, saying that the investigations into Trump are just desperate attempts at election interference to stop the presumptive Republican nominee for president, yada, yada. Let's see, another section here, rigorous and professional. I don't know what they're talking about, but that's all right. Well, Strauss, who served in the Justice Department from 2005 to 2016, said he was particularly surprised to hear about the FBI's alleged inaction considering how exceptionally thorough he said they usually are and how meticulously they planned for the Pervalago search ahead of time. Testifying before Congress last year, FBI Director Chris Wray noted that agents conducting the search even wore casual clothes to Pervalago, uh, latex stuff probably, rather than more common raid jackets so that they wouldn't draw too much attention. That's actually bit of a non sequitur there, but I guess that was supposed to be indicative of how carefully planned the raid was. So carefully planned that they said, don't bother getting dressed in your normal fashion 
go in casual clothes because of how I don't, you know, the, the idea though is that they made a conscious decision to do that etc cetera, etc cetera. Ray assured lawmakers that in such sensitive investigations our folks take great pains to be rigorous and professional but not necessarily thorough I guess. But when agents reached the locked closet near the front of Trump's residence, they actually found it, I guess, they couldn't locate a key for it and were told that the space behind the door, an old stairwell turned into a closet with shelves, went nowhere. So they decided not to break it open, sources said, which is amazing because why not? It's got shelves. Yeah, but it used to be a stairwell. And now it doesn't go anywhere because we closed off the stairwell and made a closet out of it. So the stairwell doesn't go anywhere. And I I don't know. So they say, oh, okay. Well, in that case, no, no. I'm not interested in the stairwell. I'm interested in the closet that you made out of it and what's in it. Now, if they had said, oh, nothing, you know, hats, uh, party supplies, they might have taken their word for it and moved on. But... And, and maybe that happened too. It's just not described in here. I just, I, 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 I don't understand how you're not convinced, uh, or how you're convinced not to look in there, especially if they know they can just break the door open and, yeah, we'll pay the bills. The government has the money. We'll pay for repairing it if necessary. Sources told ABC News that FBI agents didn't do more in part because they felt like they had been at Pervalago long enough. They, and remember, they were under some pressure to, you know, not totally turn the guy's life upside down, even though he stole classified documents. You're supposed to turn that person's life upside down. But he's the president, so he's got a suit, tie, and Secret Service agents. So we're, time time to go. We've been at the residence long enough. Now, interestingly, this is, a, again, a closet near the front of the residence, which means they probably reach it pretty quickly. Well, we've been here long enough. Thank you. See you later. Maybe they double back to it later. But the senior FBI official disputed that, so it doesn't even matter, saying discussions took place that day about additional areas of the property, and it was determined that actions already taken met the parameters of the search warrant. The FBI is almost notorious for their relentlessness relentlessness and follow-through, Strauss said, but not here. At the time, the FBI didn't know that the lock change, at least in their view, could have been potentially significant, sources said. And that's, again, the most incriminating thing about it is that they, I guess they, they come in. Oh, well, they don't know about the lock change. I guess before they come in, the lawyer the day before is reviewing documents in the basement and then they, they change the lock so that the lawyer doesn't get in there. But if they don't know that, it's just a closet that's locked that we don't have a key to, which no, they, of course they have a key to it. Anyway, according to the indictment against Trump, after Trump received a federal subpoena demanding the return of all classified documents at Pervalago, his attorney, identified ABC News as Evan Corcoran, was told to look for any responsive documents in boxes stacked in a basement storage room. But in the days before Corcoran arrived at Pervalago on June 2nd, 2022, Trump aide Walt Nauta, remember him, Walt Nauta, acting at quote, act Trump's direction, moved more than 30 boxes from the storage room to Trump's residence, like into the secret room, like into the closet. I don't know. So the attorney never even saw many of Trump's boxes, according to the indictment. We know that part of the story. Corcoran found 38 classified documents in the storage room and gave them to the FBI. But Trump ensured that, quote, many documents responsive to the subpoena could not be found The indictment alleges going so far as to put them in a closet and change the lock on it while the attorney is there. Through their investigation, Smith's team learned that while Corcoran was still in the storage room, Trump asked longtime Pervalago employee, a an employee, to change the lock on the closet, sources said. For years, the lock on the closet was managed by the Secret Service. So they had the key. But on June 2nd, 2022, Trump had it changed and wanted the key, the sources said. How interesting. And he has a Mar-a-Lago employee do it, too. Didn't call even an outside locksmith. They got a locksmith on site who can do these things. Still couldn't open this lock closet. How strange. One former maintenance worker described Trump's request as unusual, according to the sources. Unlike the locked closet, the FBI didn't even know 
the so-called hidden room existed until after they left Pervalago, sources said. Though agents searched Trump's bedroom, a small door on one of the walls was concealed behind a large dresser and a big TV, sources said. Of course, there's a big TV. The space behind the wall was the hidden room, which maintenance workers sporadically entered to access cables running through it, sources said. Cables, of course, that used to probably hide or, or feed hidden cameras uh, so that when they used the room off of his bedroom to invite guests to uh, take a bathing suit to go onto the pool deck and enjoy the facilities, uh, Trump could watch from another room. I wonder why there's cables in this strange hidden room. Anyway, uh, Strauss said it's not uncommon for agents executing search warrants to miss some things, especially when they're searching expansive properties. Nevertheless, the fact that witnesses were saying the FBI missed a hidden room within Trump's bedroom caught the attention of Smith's team, finally, according to sources. And lastly, a federal judge had signed off on the search of Pervalago, approving the FBI's plan to search Trump's office and all storage rooms and any other rooms or locations where boxes or records may be stored. During their search, they found allegedly 27 classified documents in Trump's office and 75 more in the basement storage room, missed by the attorney, I guess, where Corcoran had searched two months earlier and found a smaller set of other apparently classified documents, according to the indictment against Trump. The FBI did not find classified documents in any ballroom, bathroom, or in Trump's bedroom, where he allegedly stored classified documents at times over the year and a half after leaving the White House. During the summer of the FBI search, Trump was living primarily at his property in Bedminster, New Jersey, where the FBI did not search. It only searched per Vilago. There's a little bit more here. We'll finish it up, and then we'll talk more about Waltin. Waltin Nauta, back in the news. Sup, fam? It's your boy Darwin, a.k.a. Darwin underscore Darko, a.k.a. the most reasonable man in America, a.k.a. KITM's senior black correspondent. You might remember me from such recordings as Spacemen vs. Space Cadets and we Need to Talk About Joe Biden. Today, I want to bring you good news about that thing you've been struggling with. Do you suffer from giving too much of a damn? Do you turn on the series of tubes and find yourself outraged at the particular way some news organization strung some sentences together only to realize, nope, this is not some fictional hellscape? Well, guess what? You no longer have to accept the life of giving too much of a damn. You can do something about it because even you, yes you, can be a show contributor. Now I know what you're thinking. Hey, Mr. Most Reasonable Man in America, I'm not some professional podcast talking guy. Don't worry about it. Do you have a smartphone or some other electronic recording device? Well, that's all you need. You too can have a segment where you can read us an important article and give us your take. Read one of your own original essays or even just give us your commentary on something you'd like to share that's important to you. Fair warning though, side effects may include general punditry, having opinions and hot takes, getting stuff off your chest, and hearing your own voice. If your recording lasts longer than five to seven minutes, please consult kagorx at gmail.com. That's K-A-G-R-O-X at gmail.com. All right, welcome back now to the Kegor in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. There is just a little bit left to this ABC News article that we've been reading about the uh, oh-so-surprising fact that there were secret rooms in Pervalago that uh, Trump used for various reasons, up to and including confounding the FBI in their search for classified documents there. We left off with just this little bit left, and uh, eh, we might as well let uh, Chris Ray speak for himself one more time here. It says, as ABC News previously reported, Within months of the FBI search, the Justice Department suspected Trump was still holding classified documents somewhere. So, under pressure from the department, one of Trump's attorneys conducted another search of Pervalago and other properties, and he found a handful of more classified documents. I, I don't know if that's another handful, or the documents were even more classified than the other ones they found before, or whatever. But in his testimony to Congress last year, Ray said that under specific rules, there are only certain locations that can securely store classified information. And in my experience, ballrooms, bathrooms, and bedrooms are not among them. That too, a bit of a non sequitur, but uh, I don't know what that's supposed to mean, actually. 
uh, other than, I mean, I think he's offering that in the context of, well, if he was storing documents that were classified in bedrooms, ballrooms, or bathrooms, would that be okay? And the answer to that would be no. There are specific rules for where you can store classified information. It has to be secure. These places are unsecure. But that's not the question that's pending right here. It's, did you search those rooms? And I mean, if that's being offered to to say, well, we were investigating whether he had stolen classified documents. And everybody knows that classified documents under the rules can only be held in secure locations. So we only looked in rooms that could be secured. We didn't look in rooms that were unsecured because nobody would put classified documents there because we're all rules followers. That would be just plain dumb. Anyway, uh, and of course, we then later saw pictures of documents stacked in boxes in bathrooms and ballrooms, but no word on whether there were any classified documents in those boxes. But even so, it doesn't really bear at all on why didn't you search this closet or find this secret room? Anyway, uh, so do what you want with that information. Our folks in this case have proceeded honorably and in strict compliance with our policies, our rules, and our best practices, Ray added. Trump has denied any wrongdoing, insisting he did not break the law by holding onto the documents later seized by the FBI. He has pleaded not guilty to the charges against him. And then Nauta, the aide who allegedly helped move Trump's boxes and Pervalago's property manager, Carlos de Oliveira, have also been charged for their alleged roles in Trump's conspiracy. Both have pleaded not guilty. However, uh, it's weird because they are guilty. But, you know, people plead not guilty in the hopes that they won't be found guilty. Uh, I've already found them guilty, so uh, there's not much to that. But but there you have it. Now, he's also guilty of a number of other things, as it turns out. And we have some information for you about that. But I just wanted to sort of, I, I, I don't know, uh, there's a critique to be made of this ABC News article. I think they filled it in with non sequiturs and information that's only tangentially related to what was going on here, doing some research and some old articles to find quotes from Chris Ray when he testified in Congress. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I don't know what they did. I don't know why they really think that that was relevant to this, um, except to show that the FBI is kind of hidebound in in its rules and procedures, et cetera. But really all it does is illustrate that normally they're pretty thorough, but this time they weren't. And I don't know what Chris Ray had to say meant nothing with respect to this, but I don't know. Uh, it's sometimes hard to tell whether uh, reporters are just doing that by way of background or whether they are, they too have become confused by this or they have their own working theory that doesn't necessarily get fleshed out in the story, but makes sense to them in the background. And they think they're doing us a service by adding this additional information. I don't know. This one is not that convincing to me. So anyway, so I said, Walt Nauta is in the news. And it's also very interesting because earlier today or yesterday, rather, when I was, uh, this is why it was important to tell you that I had gotten cookies from Judy Vincent Hi, Judy. And uh, the 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 reason it was important was I went into my only uh, um, channel for contacting Judy directly. Apparently, we used to just do this over direct message on Twitter. And now, of course, I'm mostly not on Twitter. I haven't deleted it because there are yeah, I don't use it and I try not to add any content. But there are occasionally people I've got to get in touch with who I only can find via direct messenger or what have you like like Judy. And uh, anyway, I went, I just went to thank her for the, for the cookies. Oh, oh, and I look, now she's she's made offer of some coffee too. Uh, I'll have to take her up on that one, but I'll take care of that business offline. But when I went back, I said, I wonder what the last thing I talked to Judy about was. And I noticed a direct message from late June of last year. And her message to me was, Why do you think Waltin Nauta has had so much difficulty finding local legal counsel in Florida? 
It has been reported that Trump is paying for Nauta's legal fees. Do you think Trump may be refusing to pay for a lawyer that might advise Nauta to plead guilty and flip on Trump? Wouldn't taking a plea be the best legal strategy for Nauta? Maybe no lawyer will take a case in which Trump is trying to prevent the lawyer from giving his best advice. It would be irresponsible not to speculate. If Nauta waits too long to find a lawyer, and remember, they were delaying his appearance in court because he hadn't yet secured counsel and he was really dragging his feet on it. So if Nauta waits too long to find a lawyer, could the judge order him to use a public defender? All good questions to which I have no answer uh, at the moment. I don't know whether there was an answer then either. But what do you know? Like I said, Walt T. Nauta is back in the news today. And the subject of a report in the Daily Beast, which is itself reported in a popular diary at Daily Coast. But let me go to the uh, original Roger Solenberger on the byline for this piece. But um, uh, again, in the in the Daily Beast. All right. Uh, here's your headline. It gives it. If, does it give it away if I tell you again? Waltin Nauta is in the news. This is the who you're talking about here. Although it's hidden, they will hide the ball in the headline in order to uh, demonstrate the absurdity of it all. He was accused of sexual misconduct. Then Trump hired him. Then he was indicted in the Mar-a-Lago case. Why do I call it Pervalago? No real reason. Roger Solenberger reporting again for the Daily Beast. When Donald Trump invited his longtime White House valet, Walt Nauta, to join his post-presidential political operation in August of 2021, he was hiring a body man with serious baggage. That deserves some dramatic music for sure. That's the second time today. Weeks before Nauta, a Navy enlistee stationed with the White House presidential support detail since 2012. That's too long, really. Traded Washington, D.C. for Palm Beach. Navy officials had escorted him off the White House grounds, reassigned him to a new post, and docked his White House security clearance in response to accusations of fraternization, adultery, harassment, and other inappropriate sexual conduct, including revenge porn, two people with direct knowledge of the matter told the Daily Beast. So, of course, the next most healthy place for him to go would be down to Pervalago, where they have bikini changing rooms wired with closed-circuit television, which is, of course, revenge porn. But anyway, never mind. That really, honestly, big mistake to leave someone stationed at the White House presidential support detail as a as a valet from 2012 all the way through 2020. Like eight years of bringing Diet Cokes to presidents. Like you can't, you're in the Navy. Shouldn't you be serving the country rather than serving Diet Coke somewhere else? I, mean, I understand it's a shift and it's a legit job, but it's the sort of thing that you'd think, you're put on the job for two years and then, you know, I don't know, back at office even, back to the grind. You're in the Navy. You're an enlistee. You park the guy for a decade bringing Cokes from one room to another. It doesn't seem like a particularly good use of our troops, but what have you. Anyway, uh, the allegations came from three female service members, these sources said. While Nauta's behavior had been going on or ongoing for years, according to these sources, the women first reported it to supervisors in the spring of 2021, shortly after Nauta was recalled from his first temporary post-presidential assignment at Mar-a-Lago. Like, what? I, I don't know why they, they wait and reporting. They all have their reasons, I suppose. Um uh, What's the reaction time between having these reports made and, and the Navy saying, maybe this isn't a good person for any job? Specifically, the initial complaint stemmed from a woman's responses to a command climate survey submitted sometime around April 2021. 
Trump's already out of the White House here. The woman reported an inappropriate relationship between a senior person and a junior person, according to one of the sources with direct knowledge. Nauta, this source said, was high enough in the White House details leadership structure that he was actually among the group of Navy officials briefed on that first complaint. <laughs> it was about him. Wow. The survey responses hadn't named Nauta. They didn't make that mistake anyway. Uh, and he walked out of that meeting cool as a cucumber, ready to find the culprit. He's looking for the real killer with OJ. Wow. But a follow-up inquiry identified Nauta along with inappropriate romantic relationships with two additional women. Nauta, the same source said, admitted the relationships in a White House interview and a superior officer walked him off the property that day. The U.S. military strictly forbids fraternization, which the Navy defines as an unduly familiar relationship between members that does not respect the difference in rank or grade. Those relationships can be personal, professional, or romantic, and the steepest penalties include dishonorable discharge and forfeiture of pay. Nauta, both sources said, was accused of violating this prohibition in multiple overlapping and emotionally abusive romantic relationships while he was married and assigned to the White House. Yikes. The revenge porn included supposedly compromising images of women that Nauta had allegedly retained and threatened to make public, according to the sources. All three women told Navy officials about the alleged misconduct, the sources explained, which they said occurred while Nauta, Nauta, whatever, was Trump's White House valet fetching Diet Cokes for the parched president. That's his problem. He's parched. However, it's unclear whether the Navy officially charged Nauta with any violations or whether all parties were content to let him quickly and quietly retire without further incident. Today, Nauta faces seven federal charges for an allegedly central role in the Pervilago documents case. Got lots of problems. 99, perhaps. Prosecutors say that Nauta, at Trump's direction, repeatedly tried to thwart law enforcement officials seeking to recover dozens, dozens of boxes of documents that belong to the U.S. government, including highly sensitive national defense secrets, which Trump had stashed at his Palm Beach Resort compound. When the Pervilago case catapulted Nauta to global headlines. Newsrooms across the country scrambled to cobble together biographical profiles in an attempt to explain just how and why this person, among so many others, found himself in this position. The question at the heart of those pieces is still pounding. Why is this decorated Navy veteran putting his liberty on the line for a man who is accused of arrogating reams of national defense intelligence to himself and then dumping them in his bathtub? I don't, I don't know about bathtub, but uh, it's linked here. But it looks like it's the uh, story of the, the pictures of the boxes in the shower in the bathroom. Uh, not quite the bathtub. Anyway, there is corroborating public evidence of at least one alleged action. In response to the women's allegations, the two sources said Navy officials, naval officials, promptly pulled Nauta from the presidential support detail and reassigned him to the Navy's Washington, D.C. headquarters. That transfer appears in Nauta's service record and occurred on May 28th, 2021. While multiple sources indicated that the Navy has official records of the proceedings, it's unclear exactly what was memorialized. The Daily Beast has not been able to obtain any relevant documents through public records inquiries. Navy Personnel Command did not reply to a request for comment. In July... The New York Times reported that Nauda had been removed from the White House after the Navy learned he had fraternized with colleagues and subordinates in the White House mess. And what a mess it was. Citing people with knowledge of the matter, the report did not provide further information about the incidents, but it noted the Navy officials had been deciding next steps and were even considering sending Mr. Nauta back out to sea on a ship where, where people who are in the Navy belong. I mean, come on. Then a Trump aide contacted Nauta and offered him a permanent gig as the former president's personal body man, you know, in private uh, employment, the Times reported. When Nauta told his superiors he wanted to take the job, a source with knowledge told the Daily Beast the Navy approved. Good riddance, probably. Colby Vokey, V-O-K-E-Y, military criminal defense attorney and U.S. Marine Corps lieutenant colonel, retired, told the Daily Beast that in cases like Nauta's, the Navy does not typically have to take 
time to deliberate next steps. These allegations are common, and the Navy knows exactly what to do, said Vokey, who estimates that he's been involved with more than 100 similar cases in his career. It's a standard procedure, he said. After a preliminary inquiry establishes the validity of the claims, Vokey explained, military commanders will then often convene a deeper investigation. In the process, he said, service members are often reassigned to remove them from the situation and any proximity to potential victims or witnesses. Given the reported fact pattern of Nauta's case, Vokey observed it wouldn't be unusual for military officials to immediately place a protective order on the alleged defender. Those documents, he said, would not be publicly available. Asked whether such an order had been issued against Nauta, a person with direct knowledge of the matter told the Daily Beast that officials had indeed indicated that the Navy took this step. The only thing that complicates it is the fact that they're dealing with the Trump White House, Vokey said. Compared to typical cases of this nature, he said, the trajectory of Nauta's case was unusual for its apparent inaction. But, Vokey said, it wouldn't be surprising if the Navy saw the Pervalago offer coinciding as it did with Nauta's retirement window as an opportunity to avoid practical difficulties in investigating White House personnel and to avoid a potential public relations firestorm, especially given the national temperature in the immediate aftermath of the January 6th attack. It looks like this may have been an easy way out and the Navy took it, he said. In August, Nauta received his first paycheck from Trump's Save America Leadership PAC. The next month, he retired from the Navy at the rank of Senior Chief Petty Officer, the second highest rank a naval enlistee can achieve. His service record boasts five achievement medals from the Navy and Marine Corps, along with seven medals for good conduct. I don't know what the rest of his record is like, but I mean, I didn't know you could get medals for bringing Diet Cokes, but I guess he did. I, I'm sure he did something else earlier, and, and you, you know... It's, I don't know why you wouldn't get a medal for doing a good job as a White House valet. I just don't know why you get parked there for a decade. That seems like something a little too cush to keep people in those jobs for that long. Unless they're actually excellent and meet every requirement and have no complaints against them, which is clearly not the case here. Anyway, so uh, the choice to join Trump, it turns out, had never been Nauta's plan. When Trump departed the White House under the ignominy of the January 6th insurrection, Nauta was part of the detail assigned to help him readjust to private life, a temporary perk afforded all former presidents. Trump's detail, however, was yanked back to D.C. just weeks later. Three people with knowledge of the matter told the Daily Beast an unusually early termination. But, I mean, not all presidents retire to uh, fabulous resort uh, uh, estates with allegedly billions of dollars and an expansive staff at their disposal. So anyway, but that is because in the new administration's view, Trump, who has been catered to hand and foot since childhood and whose personal residence doubles as a full service private club, did not need to be weaned off the royal treatment, three sources said, let alone at taxpayer expense. Quite right. At the time, Nauta was months away from qualifying for retirement, but he intended to stay on with the Navy, even applying to extend his service, according to two people with knowledge of the matter. And why not? He's getting away with everything he wants. It's not clear whether Nauta wanted to continue with Biden's White House or opt for a new assignment, but after the allegations surfaced, Nauta elected a future with Trump over one with the Navy. It was perhaps the most consequential decision of his life. A year after joining the Trump payroll, Nauta was at the center of the most explosive national security scandal in recent history. Everything Trump touches dies, pal. Uh, of course, he finds himself in the middle of this scandal when a federal magistrate judge authorized the FBI to search per Lago for sensitive national security documents that Trump had taken from the White House and kept in alleged violation of federal law. Nada was indicted alongside Trump in June of 2022 when a grand jury charged him with six felonies for his allegedly central role in obstructing the investigation. While none of the charges overlap with Nada's time in the White House, prosecutors say Nada helped pack boxes that Trump took to Mar-a-Lago. The indictment also alleges that Nada was aware that Trump had squirreled away sensitive records as early as December of 2021 citing a text message that the valet sent at the time to alert a co-worker that he'd found boxes of documents spilled onto the floor of a storage area. 
I opened the door and found this, Nauta wrote in the text alongside a photo of documents scattered on the ground. Confidential labels glaring among the pile, according to the indictment. Prosecutors claim that Pervalago security footage shows Nauta moving boxes of sensitive documents to hide them from investigators and alleged that he lied to FBI agents in an interview. Asked whether he knew where those boxes had been stored, he told agents, I wish I could tell you, I don't know. I don't, I just honestly don't know, the indictment says. Weeks later, in a superseding indictment, uh, a third defendant, longtime Pervalago handyman, Carlos de Oliveira, and another uh, was uh, at another charge as well for now to, I've, I've screwed up the sentence, but you get the idea. Prosecutors implicated Nauta in another obstruction scheme, allegedly at Trump's bidding, to delete surveillance video of Trump personnel hiding government documents from officials attempting to recover them pursuant to a grand jury subpoena. Nauta has pleaded not guilty, somehow, and disputes the allegations. His lawyer, Stanley Woodward, he finally did get one, I guess, declined to comment for this article, but uh, yeah, not an independent attorney by any means. Asked for comment, Trump campaign communications director Stephen Chung did not deny the allegations, casting them instead as politically motivated smears. Da, 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 da. We'll skip over his statements because they're ridiculous. Nauta, who was born and raised in Guam, in case you were wondering, joined the Navy in 2001 in response to the September 11th attacks. What a trajectory. He became a culinary specialist and in 2012 signed on with the Presidential Food Service. Did you know about this? Known as the White House mess during President Barack Obama's administration. I know the White House mess, but I didn't realize that. The Presidential Food Service this is a, 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 something you can elect to join from out of the Navy. Uh, now to work his way up to senior chief culinary specialist under Trump. It's uh, hard work opening Cokes. Uh, presumably he did more. At one point. But then he, he, he preferred the job of moving Coke cans around. Huh? It's cushier and he had more time to sexually harass subordinates, I guess. So he worked his way up to senior chief culinary specialist under Trump, whom he served as a personal valet, a coveted position in the White House residence. In that capacity, Nauta was especially close to Trump, who I, I reportedly smells horrible, so that's not a great thing. A position of high trust that he maintained through the administration's calamitous final weeks. While Nauda could be, or would be, a critical prosecution witness, he has so far outwardly shown so, no signs of cooperating. Ty Cobb, you remember that guy, the lawyer who represented Trump during the Russia investigation and knew Nauta personally, previously told PBS News that he felt bad for the former valet, calling him a dedicated patriot whose eagerness to please made him easy prey. The proudest moment he ever had was being named valet to the president, and sadly the president he got named valet for was Trump, Cobb said. That's an interesting take. The women's allegations, however, indicate that Nauta has saw himself, uh, or rather Nauta himself, saw others as easy prey. Oh, this is a good turn. And that would also add uh, his name to a long list of Trump loyalists and Trump himself who have been accused of inappropriate conduct towards women, ranging from harassment to verbal, physical, and sexual abuse. Trump, of course, is notorious for exploiting people around him who have been compromised in one form or another. Sarah Matthews, Trump's former White House deputy press secretary who resigned in protest of the January 6th attack, told the Daily Beast that Trump wasn't above using the kind of leverage that he would have had over Nauta. Trump will use any tactic to demand loyalty from folks, whether that's blackmail, financial leverage, you name it, Matthews told the Daily Beast. She noted that Trump often plays this the other way performatively seizing on negative reports about beleaguered allies to signal his support and keep them close. When bad stories do come out in the media about allies, sometimes you'll see Trump flip it and use it to his advantage. Oh, look at the horrible lies the fake news media is spreading about this great person, she said. That's She used his voice to do it. You know that? This holds true for accusations of misconduct to women, including pedophilia allegations against former Alabama Senate candidate Roy Moore, claims of sexual harassment against White House physician Ronnie Jackson, plus the drug distribution charges he should be facing, and abuse accusations against senior White House aide Rob Porter. This is a lot of them, isn't it? One-time aides Max Miller 
and, who's now Representative Max Miller, I guess, and Corey Lewandowski have both been accused of extreme abuse towards women. Trump later endorsed Miller's congressional bid and has recently featured Lewandowski at campaign events following a short exile from Trump world. In Nauta's case, Matthews identified two kinds of blackmail for loyalty, at least. There are these allegations about his character and family life, but there's also the money, she said. In the roughly 29 months since he was hired, Nauta has been paid more than $360,000 from Trump's political committees. I can't believe he actually got paid. According to the FEC, following Trump's candidacy declaration in November of 2022, Nauta was transferred from the Save America payroll to the 2024 campaign. Trump has also covered expenses for Nauta's lawyer, Stanley Woodward, there's your answer, Judy, who has received Save America payments, maybe, as well as cash from Trump's legal defense fund. Woodward, who represents other Trump world figures, and January 6th, I think, would not confirm whether any of the defense fund payments were specifically for his representation of Nauta. You saw this with Cassidy Hutchinson, I guess, how Trump paid for her lawyer, who was also his lawyer, and how that was a barrier for her. And then when she broke with Trump World, she had to go out and hire her own attorney and find a way to pay for that. And then she changed her story. What do you know? Matthews said, uh, referencing former White House aide Cassidy Hutchinson, who famously cut ties with MAGA land to tell the public and investigators what she knew about the January 6th insurrection. This summer, a critical witness in the Mar-a-Lago case made a similar choice, firing his Trump-provided lawyer, retracting his previous grand jury testimony, and cooperating with prosecutors. That witness has also been represented previously by Woodward. How strange. Arrest Woodward. Matthews also had to overcome personal, political, and professional blowback when she left the fold and was forced to restart her life essentially on her own which is the way most people have to restart their lives, so boo-hoo. Walt, I think, must be very scared. It's got to be scary to be in his position, she said. Michael Cohen, the former Trump lawyer who titled his book about his former boss, Loyalty, said that while the previously secret story of the allegations might be some leverage, Nauda appears to be appears more swayed by the paycheck and the lifestyle, right, sure, and the access to women to harass, I'm sure, as well. Sure, maybe he's holding this over Walt Nauta's head to ensure that he doesn't say or do anything contradictory to Trump, but really it's more the money and the lifestyle, Cohen said. If Trump didn't take him with him on this journey, what would Walt Nauta have? The answer is nothing. He'd have nothing, Cohen said. But with Trump, he's flying around on a 757. There's all these cheers and jeers at rallies. You jump into the motorcade. It's all very seductive. So what else is he going to do? Open a security company? With his background, most of the country will have nothing to do with you. Trump, Cohen said, is Nauta's last hurrah. There's actually more of this. We'll finish it up and then move on to important stuff. Eh. All right, welcome back now to the K. Gordon Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Just uh, the tail end of the article here. It's a long one, a couple of long ones here today. Uh, what we had said, uh, well, we had Mike uh, Cohen offering his parting shots at uh, now to be Trump. Uh, Cohen said is now to last hurrah. Look, if Trump hypothetically wins the election, now to, for all we know, might get to go be head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Cohen said, emphasizing that he's absolutely serious. If your goal is to take full control of all aspects of government, you need a, a House Speaker like Mike Johnson as your Attorney General. You need a Walt Nauta as your head of the Joint Chiefs. You need someone like that who will always do whatever you want them to do, he said. Trump has predictably offered Nauta his public support. In a social media post the day of the initial Pervilago indictment, Trump called now to a wonderful man to try to destroy his life like the lives of so many others, hoping that he will say bad things about Trump, he wrote. He's strong, brave, and a great patriot. Loves tea, I guess. The FBI and DOJ are corrupt. That message, however, generated an echo in the second superseding indictment the next month. In one striking passage, prosecutors described Trump's inner circle simmering with concerns about De Oliveira, the handyman, amid the fallout from the Mar-a-Lago search. According to the indictment, Nauta was tapped to plumb De Oliveira's loyalty. Mm -hmm. 
Someone just wants to make sure Carlos is good. The indictment quoted Nauda telling other um, another employee, 18 days after the search, the colleague at Nauda's request then sent an encrypted text message to Nauta and senior political aide Susie Wiles, assuring them that De Oliveira was indeed loyal and would not do anything to affect his relationship with Trump. The indictment claimed Trump called De Oliveira later that day, prosecutor said, and said he would get him a lawyer. I wonder who he had in mind. Uh, was Susie Wiles the aide that uh, um, Greg mentioned yesterday who's running the campaign and, and relatively competently at that after having uh, been drawn away from the DeSantis campaign? Is that the same person or am I confusing the names? Wow. Well, connections everywhere. Uh, however, we can jump out of connection world and jump to a totally different subject, except also pretty much the same subject. I, there's like 10,000 things here on Taylor Swift, and I'm not certain where to start with all of this. And, and maybe I shouldn't even go down that, that road. Although it does seem like a Friday story. Nah, well, we'll hold it for later and maybe we'll be more selective. Uh, I, I suspect that they're all pretty much the same angle on a story that really shouldn't matter. So let me give you some other news instead. How about that? Um, let's see. One, I think, quick hit on more courtroom news, more courtroom losses for Trump. The BBC reporting yesterday that on Christopher Steele, you remember him, um, Orbis welcomes high court victory over Trump. What's going on? Gordon Correra reporting again for the BBC and says that a British consultancy, that would be uh, Orbis, right, uh, that compiled a salacious dossier linking Donald Trump to Russia has welcomed a UK high court decision to throw out a lawsuit by the former U.S. president. So he's suing in every country. Orbis Business Intelligence, run by ex-MI6 officer Christopher Steele, said it was delighted by the ruling. Mr. Trump had been seeking to use the data protection laws of the U.K. to sue the company. Mr. Steele's dossier contained unsubstantiated claims of bribery and sex parties. They're real. Funded by Hillary Clinton's Democrats, after initially being funded by Republicans, of course, they don't mention that, and other political opponents, there we are, of Mr. Trump, Republican ones. It's important to say. I don't know why they leave that out. The dossier was leaked to the media just before Mr. Trump, a Republican, was sworn in as president. In bringing the lawsuit against Orbis Business Intelligence Limited, Mr. Trump's legal team said the dossier contained claims that were inaccurate and breached his data protection rights. In th taking advantage of UK's laws for that. In Thursday's ruling in London, Mrs. Justice Stein, S-T-E-Y-N, D-B-E, and you British people will know what that is, and I don't know offhand, but sounds important, said she did not make any judgment on the allegations themselves, but she found Mr. Trump's claim had not been brought within the six-year limitation period. Another technical error. Great. Good, I'm glad of it. There are no compelling reasons to allow the claim to proceed to trial, she wrote. Orbis said the lawsuit should never have been brought. Trump has already been criticized by U.S. courts for pursuing vexatious litigation against us, Orbis said in its statement. And we feel strongly that Trump also, Mr. Trump, they say, also brought this claim in an attempt to exact revenge on Orbis and chill free speech and legitimate investigations. Orbis stands by its sources and work and will not be deflected by such lawfare practices, especially when they fall outside the statute of limitations. That's pretty funny. Another lawsuit that Mr. Trump filed against Orbis, uh, Mrs. Clinton and FBI officials, was dismissed by a federal judge here in the United States in Florida in 2022. Steele has previously said the dossier was a series of memos based on intelligence and never meant for publication. The case stems from, well, you know all about it, right? Do we need to tell you the rest of that? I don't think so. That gives us an opportunity to say, all right, we've updated you on another court case that's gone badly in the UK this time for Trump. And uh, I think we've fulfilled our mission on that one. Uh, more interesting news to get to. Let's see. This is something uh, not often, uh, well, not necessarily a Friday story, but uh, a, a, a good process story. Just wanted to kind of bring you up to speed on 
the Washington Post's coverage of stuff that Greg has tried to force to the fore in asking procedural questions about the use of suspension of the rules. Now getting uh, attention in in the uh, the daily papers, uh, not just the specialty papers like the Hill and Roll Call. Uh, Washington Post, of course, the hometown paper for Congress, but they'll be uh, more widely read than the Hill and Roll Call. Neutralizing hardliners, House Republicans using special process to pass bills. GOP leaders now pass major legislation under special calendar that also empowers Democrats in the minority. It is a kind of a weird situation, and it's also... Uh, I don't know. It's in, I mean, it, it's not new or anything, and they've been using suspension of the rules regularly every every week. There's usually dozens of of bills brought to the floor under suspension of the rules, uh, and in olden days, you know, in the before times, these were this was a procedure that was generally um, reserved for non controversial bills because you need a two-thirds vote to pass them, 290 votes in a full house versus a bare majority, you know, which uh, when everybody's there and voting is a 218. Um, so it's harder to do, but it, again, you bring non-controversial. This is where the way you do most of the post office renamings and, you know, various things that nobody cares about uh, or, or, you know, some, some of which are substantive, but which people have no particular reason to oppose. Um, you know, reclassifying a certain, I very frequently see these things, re reclassifying a certain chemical uh, that gets imported so that it's taxed and faces a different kind of a tariff than it used to, you know, and people are like, I don't know, that seems to be okay. Sure, fine, go ahead. And we'll do things that way. Um, other honorifics, stuff like that. But yeah, um, it's an inter it's interesting that they need now need to use it as a way to get around the... Freedom Caucus members of the Rules Committee planted there by uh, Kevin McCarthy, uh, and they ended up getting rid of McCarthy, which is pretty amazing. Anyway, uh, I'll read you through this version of it and comment along the way. It's by Paul Kane, and uh, in yesterday's Washington Post, late Wednesday, the House overwhelmingly approved a nearly $80 billion tax package that would renew breaks for big corporations and expand the child tax credit for millions of families using the same process used for naming post offices. Lawmakers had no chance to offer amendments on the major bipartisan legislation. Debate was brief. 40 minutes is all they get under suspension of the rules. And by using the suspension calendar, normally reserved for non-controversial matters, the legislation quickly got sent to the Senate. Republican leaders were successful in advancing a piece of priority legislation hitting a final tally of 357 to 70, well above the increased threshold of a two-thirds majority needed to pass legislation using this fast-track process. I, I, it, it's interesting to see them using it for things like tax bills, um, mostly because ordinarily you would say, well, why would we want a higher threshold to pass something? This is going to become more difficult. But when you hear stories about uh, various measures where they're like, there's a bipartisan majority in favor of this. They just need to be able to bring it to the floor, but the leadership is blocking it coming to the floor. Uh, and, and it's not usually the rules committee that's blocking it from coming to the floor. It's usually the majority leader. But when they really do want something to come to the floor, they can bring it. And even if the rules committee does want to stand in the way, but you know, it's interesting whenever they're saying there's a bipartisan majority in favor of this, the usual tool people think of is try the discharge petition. That never works, but, but try it. You can build public pressure for it. If everybody who was really for this was honest and would sign the petition, then of course it would move to the floor and they'd be able to pass it. But nobody does. You know, the people in the majority rarely are honest about those things and don't want to cross their leadership. But when the leadership wants something to get to the floor because it thinks that there's a bipartisan majority for it, but there's internal resistance in the leadership as there is with the Freedom Caucus members and the Rules Committee, they use the normal process when a bill makes a pit stop in the rules committee ahead of time to try to substantively change it with the amendments that are going to be allowed. And they're able to change it enough that it can screw things up or damage the chances of the thing being passed at all. Um, and 
you find that the leadership, you know, if the leadership is behind it and there's a bipartisan majority for it, there really is a way to get it to the floor. When you hear that there's a bipartisan majority in favor of a bill and it's not coming to the floor, that's when you, you, that's the difference. You know now that the leadership of the majority party is opposed to bringing it there. If they're not opposed to bringing it, they bring it. They bring it under suspension of the rules. So it's an easy tell. Anyway, House Speaker Mike Johnson once again found a way around the blockade from his far-right faction that regularly tries to sabotage the normal flow of legislation if it's deemed insufficiently pure for conservatives. It's the fifth time in four months that House GOP leaders have used this fast-track process for what are considered important legislative matters, but are usually considered under a formal rule that the majority party is tasked with passing. Faced with a renegade faction that votes against those rules, Republicans instead have turned to the suspension calendar to pass these critical bills, but that two-thirds requirement effectively means Johnson and Republicans give away their negotiating leverage because Democrats know that their votes are decisive in the very narrowly divided House. So, we're giving up a big part of the power of being the majority. Representative Tom Cole, chair of the House Rules Committee, said in a Tuesday interview, uh, he's got to be pissed because this was supposed to be his superpower. And he's willing to play ball with the leadership. It's that he's got crackpot idiots put there by the guy who got kicked out for doing it. Uh, well, not for doing that, but who did it in an effort not to get kicked out and then got kicked out anyway. And Cole's still stuck with these guys. Republicans first used this fast track to keep government agencies fully operational on September 30th prompting a small group of far-right Republicans to oust Kevin McCarthy as Speaker a few days later. What they really should be doing is seeing if they can move a resolution reconstituting the Rules Committee and ejecting the Freedom Caucus guys and putting mainline Republicans in there. Not like those are good guys, but at least they could say, well, look, this way at least we get to... Uh, pass more pointed Republican-focused bills instead of having to do everything important under suspension of the rules, which is a real sign of trouble. This faction has spared Johnson the same indignity after he's used this process to get around its demands, but each time GOP leaders have gone down this path, they already the already bad look got worse when the final vote tally came down. The minority party effectively became the majority party, providing the bulk of the overall votes. In mid-December, when the House voted on the final version of the National Defense Policy Bill, Democrats provided 163 votes and Republicans 147 for the bill. On January 18th, the day before another potential government shutdown, Republicans mustered just 107 votes for the stopgap bill that funded agencies into March. Democrats provided 207 On Wednesday, that scenario played out again as 188 Democrats and 169 Republicans supported the tax package, prompting one rank-and-file Democrat to mock the GOP and declare that Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffries is effectively the House Speaker. Every major piece of legislation in this Congress, today expanding the child tax credit, has passed with more Democratic votes than GOP votes. Eric Swalwell of California posted on social media after the tax vote. In negotiating the package, House Ways and Means Committee Chair Jason T. Smith, almost forgot about that guy, of Missouri, sought to renew tax breaks for corporations on their research and development costs, as well as other business expenses from the 2017 GOP tax cuts. With Democrats controlling the Senate, Smith needed to win over Senator Ron Wyden, chairman of the Senate Finance Committee, who in turn demanded the expansion of the child tax credit, a major liberal priority. The House Ways and Means Committee approved the package on a 40 to 3 vote, the type of traditional win-win compromise that in a previous era of Congress would have swept quickly into law with little opposition. That normally would have involved Cole's committee, the Rules Committee, formulating rules of debate and with nine members of the majority and just four in the minority, that panel is stacked so that the speakers can always have their way. The Rules Committee determines how much debate time there is and which lawmakers can offer which amendments. The majority, by tradition, is responsible for approving the rule in committee and on the House floor, allowing for debate and consideration of the legislation. The minority almost never 
votes for the majority's rules. But the House's far-right contingent decided last year to blow up the regular order of legislative business, vowing to vote against the rules if it did not support the underlying bill. With a razor-thin majority, McCarthy and Johnson have been embarrassed collectively five times in watching a procedural rule vote fail, stopping the legislation in its tracks. Numerous other times, the leaders pulled the rules votes from the floor knowing it would fail. In the previous 20 years, not one rule vote failed. Democrats are happy to be able to shape legislation in their direction, when Johnson resorts to the fast-track process to get around his right flank, but frustrated by the historically poor output from the House since Republicans took control last year. They need Democrats to be able to pass them, so that's a good thing. The bad thing? There's no amendments in order. Very little debate. Representative Jim McGovern, the ranking Democrat on the Rules Committee, said on Wednesday, For the foreseeable future, the House GOP is only capable of passing a rule on legislation that is so conservative that the most conservative members will vote for it, in which case it has no chance of ever being considered in the Senate, let alone getting to President Biden for his signature. McGovern recently discovered an amazing statistic. The last time Republicans passed a rule on a bill that eventually became law was May 31st meaning it's been a full eight months without regular order in the House leading to something becoming law. And actually, that vote saw the incredibly rare move of more than 20 Democrats stepping across the aisle to support the rule and help it pass, because Biden wanted their support for the debt and budget deal that he had negotiated with McCarthy. We're just not getting anything done, McGovern lamented. That is pretty startling. The staunch conservatives want to have the right to essentially redraw legislation to their liking in secret, despite the committee's previous work. They did this last summer when the House Armed Services Committee passed a defense bill on a 58 to 1 vote, only to have a group of far-right lawmakers rework the bill in secret and stuff it with social conservative riders. The other members, if they want to have a say, ought to have a say. They're members of Congress. Representative Byron Donalds, a member of the House Freedom Caucus, said before Wednesday's vote, and to move bills, especially something that's massive, by suspending the rules, we usually do that for post offices and something that's inconsequential that we know everybody's just going to support, not for major pieces of legislation. Well, they used to just use closed rules for things like that instead. I mean, it's not like there weren't major bills that would come to the floor that were protected from amendment before. They used to do that all the time. In fact, most bills are protected in some way. They they allow certain amendments, but not others. Almost all bills happen that way, when they're even when they're working under regular order. Anyway, indeed, the vote for the tax bill came on the suspension calendar uh, before the tax bill came on the suspension calendar was for naming a Texas post office after three fallen soldiers. 214 Republicans and 206 Democrats voted yes on that one. Two Republicans, Representatives Chip Roy and Matt Rosendale, Texas and Montana, respectively, also members of the Far-Right Freedom Caucus, voted present as a way to protest the Speaker's machinations. Cole believes that the best way to get the most conservative outcome would be to approve the rules vote which would allow them, which would then allow for amendments and only require a simple majority to approve legislation. If Republicans had just agreed to pass a rule Wednesday to consider the tax bill, they would have needed far fewer than 50 Democrats, and they wouldn't have needed any of them probably to pass the legislation, making their negotiating position better than using the suspension calendar and needing close to 120 Democrats for passage. We're weakening our ability to get things done by not playing by regular order and supporting the rules. Or the rule, Cole said. Why wouldn't far-right members just offer an olive branch and approve the rules in exchange for getting votes on their preferred amendments? They don't trust GOP leaders, not even Johnson. This town is full of promises to be paid later, Donalds said. I think there are a lot of members... We're done with that. And I guess they're done legislating as well. So fantastic news as far as it goes. And uh, really startling just how badly they've lost control of their ability to legislate. It's been eight months since they've made a law in the House. That's incredible. And even when they did, they did that 
with Democratic votes. Okay, that is pretty amazing. Uh, I got to turn to this one now uh, for an update, although should I be saving this for the last segment? Maybe. That would be a pretty good idea, I think, because we're going to want to linger on that one. Um, Hmm. What other fun ideas might be uh, worth sharing? Oh, well, then again, there's another thing. We should return to that uh, weird story about the uh, Chinese propaganda as well. All right. How about this one for fitting in to the last bit of segment three here? Um, This report from out of Arizona, which I thought was interesting. I guess this is the natural progression in the independent state legislature theory saga. And apparently this is not the first time they have proposed this. So even before they found out the limitations of uh, the legal reach, I guess, of the supposed independent state legislature theory, Arizona has tried this before. But KNAU, Arizona Public Radio, reporting this story, proposed resolution in the Arizona state legislature would give that body the authority to override the popular vote. What is happening here? An Arizona lawmaker wants to give the state legislature the power to appoint presidential electors, which they can take if they want to, but they want to do it regardless of who wins the popular vote in Arizona. Bree Burkett, by the way, the reporter on this KNAU piece here, Currently, the candidate who wins the popular vote gets Arizona's electors, you know, the normal way that things work in this country and in most states. Then those electors cast their votes on the same day in December alongside all the other electors across the country. They're not actually physically alongside them. Everybody is in their state capital. But Senate Concurrent Resolution 1014 in the Arizona State Legislature would override that process entirely. Instead, the Arizona legislature would have the sole authority to appoint the presidential electors, regardless of which candidate actually received the most votes. The proposal comes from State Senator Anthony Kern. The Glendale Republican was a frequent figure in the attempt to overturn the 2020 election. That's probably not surprising. He was among the lawmakers who signed on to a document falsely claiming to be one of Arizona's electors, for former President Donald Trump. So this is a guy who was who, who was a fake elector who's still serving in the state Senate here. This is a uh, 14th Amendment, uh, a potential uh, target of the 14th Amendment, Section 3, if you ask me. And maybe, we'll, maybe we should read some about that in the next segment, too. The Arizona Attorney General's Office confirmed Kern and the other fake electors were under investigation last year. Kern was photographed in the crowd of the January 6th insurrection at the U.S. Capitol. He's not running for re-election. That's good. And has, oh, I'm sorry, but that's because he set his sights on Congress instead, which is almost precisely what the framers of the 14th Amendment had in mind and would like to see prevented. If the legislature passes the resolution, it will then go on November's ballot for voters to decide if it should be added to the state constitution. It has yet to be assigned to a committee. So it doesn't sound like there's a great chance of putting that on the ballot, but uh, it's not just necessarily something that they grab and do by resolution. I guess that's sort of misleading. I was wondering, that does seem like a pretty momentous change to make without actually amending the state constitution, but that's what they're planning to do. Um, Whether or not that's something, that seems like a long shot, right? To have a popular vote on whether or not to ignore the popular vote later on, but um, I guess that's the way they want to do it. But yeah, I guess they figured that uh, this was in this was something they needed to do after facing uh, defeat on the stupid independent le- state legislature theory or the super version, super charged version of the independent state legislature theory, which would have held that. They already had this power. I mean, actually, this is pretty interesting. Introducing this resolution and trying to get it on the ballot so that it could be approved as a constitutional amendment is a pretty thorough way of repudiating the old theory, which held that they already had this power. And that was from a backwards and upside down understanding of 
the way states are permitted under the federal constitution to choose their electors. They do have the right to choose as a method of assigning their electors that the state legislature name them, either in disregard of the popular vote or without even taking a popular vote for president. They can do it either way, but the supercharged version of the theory was that you can opt for a popular vote in the state. And then if you don't like, for whatever reason, the outcome of that popular vote, then you can take a second bite of the apple and reclaim the power and nominate your, you know, elect your electors directly from the legislature, which I don't think anybody thinks would pass constitutional muster. But if you decide ahead of time that you're not going to have an election, well, that's something you actually probably could get away with. Uh, but this uh, looked to change the procedure, realizing, of course, that the, the procedure that they were previously suggesting was unconstitutional and unfair. And uh, I don't know. I'll take that admission. That's good news. Uh, but uh, yeah, OK, so this is likely going nowhere. I just sort of wanted to point that out. But I did see that um, it's it's apparently been tried before, but it's not documented in this article. But maybe we can dig it up. Hi, everybody. It's me, David Waldman. Yes, the same guy who interrupts you all the time. Interrupting you one more time, just to tell you again, another reminder that your contributions are what keep this show on the air. And Patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com, is still among the easiest ways to make the sustaining subscription donations that keep us afloat. Are you ready for the pep talk about how our Patreon campaign is still going strong and growing? Well, too bad! Yeah, the plain fact is we actually are headed in the wrong direction, and whereas we once had about uh, 175 monthly patrons, we're now actually down below 150. Time to recruit some more. Not exactly the kind of news I wanted to share, but there it is. For those of you in a position to support the show, Patreon.com does make it easy to make those secure, recurring monthly contributions to do so. Patreon.com slash KGROX gets you straight to our donation page. We've been through a lot together. The worst of the pandemic, we hope. The worst of the insurrection, we hope. So go ahead and treat yourself. You don't need an excuse. Give yourself the gift of a little something you enjoy in life. Support the show. And of course, if you happen to prefer using PayPal or even the Square Cash app, we're up and running on those options too. So thanks again, everyone, for all your support. We couldn't or at least shouldn't do it without you. Hope you'll be on board soon, too. Thanks for all your support. All right, welcome back now to the KGO in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Last chance to give you more information before the weekend. Uh, I can't come up with the news article that proves that this was the at least second attempt for State Senator Anthony Kern of Arizona to change the rules of the election this way. But I did see that Carolyn Fiddler at some point yesterday when this story was breaking had mentioned, I think, on Blue Sky that uh, this isn't even the first time that they've tried this in Arizona. It's not clear that it was Kern both times, and I don't think she elaborated. I should go back and take a look. I was looking for a news article that would flesh that out, but I haven't found it yet. And I wonder if, um, you know, maybe I can search... Blue Sky while we're cruising along here to see if uh, she did, in fact, return to that um, subject. But, you know, this is the sort of thing that she would know offhand that this had not, uh, this wasn't the last or the first time to see this happen. But mm. it's, uh, let me see if I can find whether she's discussed it any further. I mean, here's her account. By the way, uh, just like on Twitter, she's just working under C Fid F I D D C F I D D at blue you know blue sky dot social or whatever it is, at C Fid dot B S K Y dot social. You know how the blue sky social stuff works. Anyway, let's see. Does she? Um, the, this is not an easy thing to do every time. But uh, all right, we'll see if we can find her other. Posts. I don't know. I'm going to have to scan and see if we can figure out 
whether she elaborated on it. But that's not the most important part. The most important part was that you know that it was happening once and that someone as smart as Carolyn Fiddler was around to tell you, yeah, 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 this guy does this regularly, or at least the Arizona state legislature tries this every once in a while. And other states, I'm sure, have been considering it too. Okay, time to switch gears to another story and uh, and then make our decisions about what to ignore and what not to. I got to go back to this Groundhog Day. We'll return to an old story. Remember the wackadoodle Ziegler family down in Florida? Christian, the husband, was a state party chair for the Republicans of uh, Florida, which is a big state and everything. And Bridget Ziegler, uh, wackadoodle wife, was co-founder of Moms for Liberty and on the school board and, you know, basically both were moral scolds for traditional values and yada yada. But as it turns out, they were way into uh, threesome swinger sex. Oh, well, these things happen. Well, uh, okay, so we're over that. But uh, anyway, new evidence in their case. Christian Ziegler is uh, a complete moron and... And by the way, making Bob Menendez level uh, errors in hoping to uh, get around an investigation. Yeah, uh, you'll see what I mean here. Like, uh, uh, remember that uh, Menendez of late has been in the news not only for the gold bars thing, but doing things like Googling how much is a gold bar worth. Right. Well, OK. So while touting family values agenda, the Ziegler's were on the hunt for threesome partners, police report reveals. This written up by Michael Barfield for the Florida Center for Government Accountability, or FLCGA.org. And here's the latest. While Republican power couple Christian and Bridget Ziegler publicly pushed for family values and backed an agenda widely viewed as anti-LGBTQ, and remember, if you're going to have a threesome and you believe in only two genders, somebody here is LGBTQ. They were secretly on the hunt for threesome lovers and had prior concerns that the woman who alleged Christian sexually assaulted her was too, quote, broken to properly consent to their advances. Newly released police reports from the now closed rape investigation reveal. Remember, of course, that Christian Ziegler stands accused of raping this woman by arranging for a threesome with her only to show up without his wife and say, oh, yeah, she couldn't make it. And when this additional partner said, well, if it's not the three of us and it's just the two of us, I'd rather not. And he said, well, I don't care. And allegedly went on to to rape her. Uh, this is an interesting angle on things. The the I mean, it's actually kind of almost touching, right, uh, to find out that somebody in this relationship was like, well, maybe we shouldn't include her in this because maybe she's not got it together enough as a person currently under her current circumstances to properly consent. Like, that's responsible. That might even be, you know, like an acceptable way of approaching such a relationship, uh, even under a progressive lens, uh, which is surprising and I guess also all the more uh, disturbing that they are instead in public arch conservatives. For everybody else, you know, this has to happen. But for us, we get to do our, our libertine thing and to do it from a progressive standpoint, which is really crazy, except I guess Christian really wasn't into the whole thing. It sounds like Bridget was the one who was most concerned about this stuff. And really, Bridget, you need to get out of this. I mean, Christian doesn't seem to care about anybody. Anyway, among the startling evidence recovered from Christian's cell phone, according to the report, was a list of women, according, or rather, um, uh, let me see if I can get ready for this one, because this is going to, this is going to require some, some work here. Uh, so on Christian's cell phone is a list of women, including the alleged sexual assault victim's name, with a one word subheading. They've got a list of women and the subheading of this list is just, yeah, the F word here. This is like, this is my list, including this like one, don't keep a list on the phone. Two, don't call it your list. Just say 
friends or squash partners. I don't know anything, but whew. I mean, how about the arrest me list? Uh, uh, whatever. Okay. Police recovered text messages though, between Christian, the now former chairman of the Florida GOP and Bridget, who is still Sarasota County school board member. And whew, they, uh, the, and, uh, by the way, co-founder of Moms for Liberty. Now Moms for Three liberty or moms for libertines or libertin libertinism, but uh, anyway, so straight ahead from the article, the texts between the two of them regarding their previous relationship with the woman who alleged that Christian raped her on October second. Now. The report indicates that the couple first engaged in a three-way sexual encounter with the woman roughly three years ago, and it was on February 19th, 2021, and they probably should have been at home under lockdown, but, uh, you know, they love liberty, that Christian texted his wife to, quote, come home, stop, and pick up the woman to play again and be crazy. Ugh. I mean... Look, I don't care that much that they're doing this. Well, okay, some part of me cares just that they are doing this. But it's, just, you know, of course the hypocrisy, but not only the hypocrisy, but just, again, the terminology. I mean, I don't know. Even if these people weren't hypocrites, the play again and be crazy. Just, I don't know. I don't know what else you're going to call it. Yeah, I told you not to just call it the F list. So maybe this is a step ahead. I'm, I, I, obviously, there's no way to, for me to accept what you're doing here. So... I guess it's not going to work. Um, anyway, this all according to the police report. Christian further wrote to his wife that the woman, quote, was an alcoholic, nice person with some issues, but with no drama. Okay. Which, quote, turns him on. <laughs> Rich. <laughs> Bridget was worried that the woman was, quote, well, I need my, uh, let's see, I'll use a different, uh, I mean, since I'll be bleeping a different word here, I'll use a different sound. Bridget was worried that the woman was going through some, yeah, some S, and wrote that she prefers confident, empowered people, according to the report. And somehow, I don't retch on that one. Like, okay, she's... This is actually relatively healthy, I guess. Like, if they're going to have three-way relationship, look, I want somebody who's confident, who knows what they're doing, and who isn't going to be, like, claiming that we coerced them into this, they're making this decision on their own, and they're not going to bring their problems and their drama, and maybe also just sexually for her that's more fulfilling, whatever, but okay. That part I don't care as much about, or don't care to probe any further let's say but you know this is she is taking a fairly responsible approach to this even though she shouldn't be doing this at all because she's telling everybody else in the world you can't have this only i can have this only i am responsible enough to do this even though i'm in it with a lunatic who rapes people oh well so she goes on to say, I just don't want to feel like we ever take advantage of anyone. I know it's always been consensual, but she seems broken. Bridget wrote her husband in an eerily prophetic text. I don't know. That's the vibe I pick up from her. And my nature is more like my name. This is interesting. My nature is more likely to help her versus, you know, which and that's the quote, which I think is her almost coming to the point of acknowledging Christian is problematic in her relationship, in their relationship with others. Uh, they don't belong together. Christian Ziegler concluded that the couple needed, quote, to hunt for somebody new. They're going to be on the hunt, on the prowl. Two and a half years later, on October 2nd, 2023, Christian would be accused by the woman of raping her while she was drunk on tequila, apparently that's important, and unable to consent. That day, he had offered the woman a threesome involving Bridget, but then told her his wife couldn't make it. The woman canceled, but Christian arrived anyway at her apartment. She later alleged that he raped her 
while Christian told police that he had consensual sex with her. Police have closed the rape investigation with no charges filed, while a separate video voyeurism case remains under review at the state attorney general's office, or rather the state attorney's office, concerning Christian's recording of the sex act with the woman, allegedly without her knowledge. So, insult added to injury, which I guess, uh, as long as it's there, they can use it to charge him with something, even if they're not going to charge him with rape. Our review is active and ongoing, State Attorney Ed Brodsky told the Trident. We are closely, or rather working closely, with the Sarasota Police Department and are unable to comment further at this time. Christian Ziegler met the woman years before at the Joyland Nightclub in Bradenton. Sounds like a good, wholesome place, according to the newly released information from police. And then we start to get to some of the weird details of how dopey he really is. The woman told Detective Ziegler, quote, had been sexually battering her for years, and she never felt like she could say no to him. She also told detectives Ziegler had entered her house on a prior occasion by climbing through an unlocked window because of how upstanding he is and how open he is about his relationships. Detectives recovered a December 16th, 2021 text message on Ziegler's phone that appears to corroborate part of her story. Quote, I can come through window, he wrote her at 11.24 p.m. All right, thanks for the evidence. The report also shed new light on the investigation in the days following the alleged rape. When detectives interviewed the victim... They noted the woman appeared as if she had been drinking and observed a partially empty bottle of tequila sitting on her bar. The manager of a nearby restaurant visited by the woman on the day of the incident told police that she appeared to be intoxicated, looking troubled and couldn't walk very well. After detectives interviewed Ziegler in early November, they discovered he performed, this is the part here, that he had performed numerous Google searches on his phone regarding sexual assault allegations, including, <laughs> quote, what is the average settlement for a premises liability sexual assault case? Like, okay, he's been to a lawyer uh, after the charges are filed. He said, yeah, what you're looking at here is a premises sex liability sexual assault case. Well, yeah, and she may have you dead to rights. Well, what's the average settlement there? So what am I looking at? How can I write this off as a business expense? How much should I be looking at here? Uh, he also uh, Googled how sex crimes are investigated and prosecuted in the state of Florida. No reason. Christian, whom the woman said liked to communicate in Instagram vanish mode, also searched for can vanish mode messages be recovered on Instagram, i.e., will there be evidence against me? Christian also searched for OnlyFans, an internet subscription service featuring sex workers, followed by a search for, quote, remove subscriptions from list. <laughs> so he obviously subscribes to some things that he thought would be incriminating as well. The controversy over the allegations led to his ouster from his chairmanship of the Republican Party of Florida. While Florida Governor Ron DeSantis publicly called for Christian's resignation, he's been silent on Bridget Ziegler, whom he personally endorsed for school board and appointed to the state's Walt Disney Oversight Committee, where she continues to sit because it's important that she have control over this family venue. She has pushed many DeSantis-backed measures in Sarasota schools that have been widely criticized as discriminatory of the LGBTQ community, of which she's a member, and also helped formulate Florida's so-called Don't Say Gay Bill. While Bridget Ziegler vacated her position at the conservative nonprofit Leadership Institute, not the Moms for Liberty, but the Leadership Institute, and that we have a history with. We've read about the Leadership Institute here for, you know, not constantly all this time, but for years now. And that was also, by the way, someplace that James O'Keefe was affiliated with for a while. And he was one of the, one of the top names. Uh, attached to it, and then it kind of, it was a place, I think, that trained, uh, Charlie Kirk and his getting him ready for Turning Point, et cetera. I mean, this is a major indoctrination way station for wingnut welfare. 
the Leadership Institute. Uh, she used it, Bridget Ziegler did, to train conservative parents to run for school boards around the country, making problems for everybody and putting perverts in charge of your kids' schools. She remains on the school board despite calls for her resignation by countless residents and all four of her colleagues on the board, none of whom I guess were interested in three-way sex with her. Eh, well, what can you do? Um, you know... She's a bad person. She's better than Christian. She seems more concerned with the uh, the psychological health of her sexual partners and their consent, and that's a good thing. But beating up on the LGBT community while, you know, secretly enjoying its fruits does not seem like a tenable position or at least qualification for good person status. Sorry, you're kicked out of the good person club. Okay. That leaves us with a few minutes left in today's show to do what? Uh, shall we use it to prepare you for what will undoubtedly be another wild weekend of Taylor Swift news? Maybe. Uh, I don't think we can get through the rest of the Chinese propaganda story. And really, we have the heart of the matter there already as it is. And uh, But I do recommend you read, peruse this uh, that piece. I'll remind you of the name. Uh, New York Times article, A Global Web of Chinese Propaganda Leads to a U.S. Tech Mogul. That a piece from, um, well, originally published on August 5th of this year and updated on August 10th. So, I mean, it's been floating out there a long time. I missed it entirely until uh, people were laughing and pointing at Nancy Pelosi for calling out Code Pink activists for their having, for their being headquartered in China. And everybody thought, that's crazy. They're a U.S. domestic political group. How dare you? What have you lost your mind? Are you senile? What's happening here? And it, it turned out to have a basis in reality. So I, I do recommend that you take a look at that. And it is amazing. I'd love to know. It's not revealed in the article that the, the exact process by which this happened, but I'd love to know how Code Pink American anti-war activists from an ultra, you know, lefty, not ultra lefty, but, you know, a very left wing and, and certainly um, ultra anti-war stance comes to also advocate in defense of the uh, Chinese detention of the Uyghur population. That's really rather remarkable. Anyway, we'll not go further into this. Let's instead, oh, all right, we're going to do a little bit of Taylor Swift stuff just because it's so amazing and I can't believe it. Now, let's see. Uh, of interest here, let's see, I put aside the stories uh, just to sort of document the Trump aides vowing holy war on Taylor Swift and how crazy that is. Rolling Stone did a piece on it. TMZ, of course, did a piece on it, and they quoted the Rolling Stone stuff extensively and, and populated their article with screen grabs and links to Twitter posts from MAGA world lunatics saying various things about Taylor Swift. Um New York Times has covered it, uh, but I think I have here um, something from, well, a number of newsletters, gosh, and I think I've got something, though, from um, uh, one of our one of our usual favorites, Amanda Marcotte, on this, and, and maybe that's the angle to take on this thing. Uh, before leaving her. Why MAGA fears Taylor Swift at the Super Bowl? And I guess it's supposed to get at some of the underlying psychology, not just the ugly things that they're saying. The Taylor Swift and Travis Kelsey conspiracy, <laughs> the idea of conspiracy, illustrates how the MAGA cult controls its followers. Let's see what this is about. Well, she says that spiraled rapidly on Sunday night. The Kansas City Chiefs beat the Baltimore Ravens in a win that cinched a Super Bowl spot for the Chiefs. Much of the postgame celebration focused on the presence of pop star Taylor Swift, who smooched her boyfriend, Chiefs tight end Travis Kelsey, and smiled winningly at the cameras. To normal people, this was a sweet moment and a chance for fans of both Swift's music and the NFL to coo over young-ish love. They're not that young, right? To right-wing media... In MAGA influencers, however, it was swiftly cemented as proof, yeah, 
that white conservatives are under threat of annihilation from a deep state woke conspiracy to force the socialist revolution led by uh, President Joe Biden somehow. The hysterics kicked off shortly after the chief's victory when a failed presidential candidate and professional right-wing troll Vivek Ramaswamy tweeted, quote, I wonder who's going to win the Super Bowl next month, and I wonder if there's a major presidential endorsement coming from an artificially, culturally propped up couple this fall. Just some wild speculation over here. Let's see how it ages over the next eight months. In case you're struggling to follow what he's saying, it's this. The Super Bowl, he's saying the Super Bowl is rigged in favor of a Chiefs win in February so that a fake celebrity couple gets even more attention, which will then use to propel Biden to a win in November. Honestly, it makes a Trump conspiracy theory about a national cabal of election rigging sound lightweight. But the silliness of it did not stop the conspiracy from spreading rapidly through the right-wing media ecosystem. Nikki McCann Ramirez at Rolling Stone documented how MAGA influencers kept claiming the Super Bowl is, quote, the Democrats' Taylor Swift election interference psyop. And the Super Bowl is totally scripted to elect Joe Biden. World War III will likely follow in a second Biden term and millions will die. Wow. Soon, the nonsense manifested on Fox News, which knows how to validate the lunacy, but in a soft peddled way that can sound less delusional on its surface than the crap on social media. And I guess the grab here, Aaron Rupar taking a shot from the story here. Fox News is devoting a segment to attacking Taylor Swift and Travis Kelsey beyond, or it was our bold strategy, Cotton. I guess is that Tom Cotton on there complaining about this thing? I'm going to skip over the embedded links here. Fox competitor OAN, you know, what we call the Un-American News Network, however, feels no need to sound more respectable. They aired a segment on Monday with a host claiming that sports as a whole, I guess, are nothing but a psyop to get kids plugged into the cycle of going to public indoctrination camps, playing sports at their schools and going to games. She used the word brainwashed repeatedly and complained that it was a distraction from following Jesus. So now this is where we are. Let's see how popular this is with normal-ish, even MAGA sympathetic normies. Yeah, sports as a whole, every sport, even the one you participate in, even pickleball, is brainwashing to keep you away from Jesus. Okay. Now, Trump himself is getting involved, reportedly raging that he's more popular than Swift and has more followers. If that sounds like a cult leader feeling threatened by the outside world, well, that's no coincidence. The Swift hatred resembles the argument that cults and other high-control groups make to their followers. Cut off all contact with the outside world. Abandon everything that gives you joy and pleasure. Sports, for instance. And dedicate your life, the entire life, to the cult's ideology. Trump and his henchmen sound like David Koresh or Warren Jeffs for a reason. I don't know Warren Jeffs, thankfully. The MAGA media system, wittingly or not, leans heavily on a favorite tactic of cult leaders, painting the outside world as a threat. Paranoia and alienation are a cult leader's best friends. After all, if the followers discover people outside the group are normal and happy, they might start questioning the cult leader and seeking ways to escape. So it's best to make them afraid to even look out of their own windows. MAGA Media has been stro stoking hatred of both Kelsey and Swift for a while now. For the older white reactionaries who make up the bulk of the Republican base, the couple is a focal point for their outrage at younger white people for being more open-minded and progressive than their elders. The rage has gone into overdrive with the two hooking up, however, as if these young lovers have no right to be together. It's another way the MAGA media operates by cult logic. High-control groups often take a negative attitude toward romantic autonomy. Leaders will tell disciples who they are and are not allowed to date. They often escalate to picking spouses for members or forcibly breaking up their relationships. So it's no surprise that the attitude is being projected outward onto these celebrities in a very public romance. Last year, for an investigative report on the impact of social media on right-wing conspiracies, one woman I spoke to about her conspiracy theorist husband brought up the NFL in our interview. He tried to convince me that the NFL was run exactly like the WWE and that it was entirely scripted. You know, P.S., by the way, Vince McMahon, uh, husband of Linda McMahon, the small business administrator, 
administration uh, chief for the Trump administration, uh, recently forced out of his role as WWE chieftain, but also uh, was because of uh, sexual misconduct allegations. So great. Anyway, uh, so this woman's husband said, oh, the NFL is all scripted. And uh, he apparently was already, she was already planning to leave, I guess, the marriage. But she brought this up, she said, because it illustrated how these political conspiracy theories are rarely self-contained. Her husband was enmeshed in a web of delusions that reached into every corner of his life. And that's why it's not a minor thing. The MAGA media pushing this idea that the NFL is fixing the Super Bowl. It's in the mix with the big lie and QAnon conspiracy theories, all part of the same tapestry of paranoia the MAGA leaders use to control the base. By telling adherents that everything around them is fake, rigged, or otherwise more sinister than it seems, the leaders convince their disciples to distrust everyone and everything, except, of course, the beloved MAGA figureheads. The irony of this is that it inverts reality. Most of what MAGA calls fake or rigged is real. NFL games aren't fixed, and neither are American elections. Swift's popularity is authentic, despite the MAGA crowd insisting it's made up. There's no ulterior agenda to Kelsey championing vaccines or Black Lives Matter. COVID-19 is not a hoax, and Biden is not being puppeteered by Vice President Kamala Harris. But the one person that the MAGA base puts their faith in, Donald Trump, is a lying sociopath through and through, which is why they insist that everything decent is corrupt and rotten. It's only in a topsy-turvy reality that they can convince themselves that Trump is the hero. It's a wild and far-reaching theory about the otherwise wild and far-reaching and stupid and wrong and non-existent conspiracy theory on the other side. Well... There's a lot of writing about this, and we really shouldn't be that obsessed about it. But it's in the news, and it has some implications, and it may or may not help us understand. If anybody's going to help us understand anything about it, I guess it would be Amanda Marcotte, though. There's plenty of good writing about it all over the place. We may sample from those waters sometime next week. Uh, Lots of other things that I wanted to tell you about, some things that Scott had tipped me off to that might just have to wait until next week because you hear the music. Actually, the music is insisting that they wait until next week. Now time, though, to hand things over to Justice Putnam for the Friday edition, the Blue Moon Spirits Friday edition of the West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, wherein he will no doubt take up the banner of some of these stories, plus some other ones that we missed. Get you informed for the weekend. Stay tuned. EdwardsRadio.com. You have been listening to K Grow in the Morning with David Waldman. Ooh, one of those stories that he's got on tap here the Oregon Supreme Court rule that eight Republican lawmakers will be blocked from running for re election. Hmm, where does that come from? After refusing to attend Senate floor sessions for six weeks last year, they were doing the remove ourselves from the floor to deny a quorum thing. And guess what? It lands them in legal trouble. Stay tuned.